Leading actor, writer and producer. He was once labelled the most hated man in Britain by the Daily Mail, and so he's in our good books already and he hasn't even said a word. <laughs> Now, Chris contacted me at a CAMS LMC a couple of years ago, and genuinely I wasn't sure until I met him if this was just friends playing a prank on me, because unbeknownst to poor Chris, uh, he'd inadvertently contacted someone who had chosen one of his pieces of work as their mastermind semi-final specialist subject. Um, 17 points, no passes. Uh, <laughs> like many people who cross my path, he was probably quite troubled and, to be honest, legitimately a little bit scared, uh, which is maybe why he's agreed to speak today. Uh, in actual fact, Chris was born the eldest son of two GPs whose surgery was in my LMC's constituency, and I'm delighted to say that that practice is still going strong. Steeped in general practice, the seminal 1967 book, A Fortunate Man, The Story of a Country Doctor, was based on the life of his godfather. Conference, I cannot begin to express to you the admiration I have for this man. All I can say is that when he speaks, you need to listen. So let's do that, and welcome Chris Morris. Thank you, Stacey. Um, just get these sorted out, get my right specs on. Um, it's not quite true what Katie said. I'm just here to sort of fill in at the start of the day to pad the day out because there's not much going on with the health service at the moment. Um, Steve Barton seems to have sorted out the crisis in general practice by deciding that you can't have a crisis in general practice if general practice doesn't exist. Um, he also seems to have realised that you can tell patients anything because he's not going to be here in 18 months to carry the can. In fact, where Streeting's going to have to do that, he's going to have to answer for a service which will, at that time, be carried out by Superdrug and children with stethoscopes. <laughs> um, Katie phoned me up and she said, Hello, I'm Katie Bramble Stainer, and I think that Matt Hancock should have his eyes pulled out through Andrew Lansley's arse. <laughs> um, she said, I'm chairing the LMC conference, um, and you will be saying a few words at the start. And I said, Okay, but really, what can I usefully say to a room full of doctors? So I don't know anything that they don't know. I can't do that, I'm, I'm like a Harley Street GP, I'm not properly qualified. <laughs> um, she said, just say something about being a patient, from a patient's point of view. And I said, well, okay, I sort of consider myself quite lucky. I hardly ever go to the doctor, I don't really feel like a patient, which was true at the start of the call. <laughs> Three hours later, <laughs> I had ruptured eardrums and nosebleed, I felt dizzy, and, uh, I felt faint, stabbing chest pains, breathlessness. Um, it was very much like the time I phoned Babylon and they diagnosed trigger thumb. <laughs> Actually, I should say I'm worse than underqualified to speak to you because, as Katie said, both of my parents were GPs, so my idea of your job is that all you have to do is say, leave it alone and get better. <laughs> um, I grew up in a rural practice in the early 60s. The surgery was in the house, the practice phone rang in the kitchen. It was 24-7 care at that point. It was a stressful life. Um, my parents' standing orders, what they were paying out, was greater than their combined income. And across the country, practices were dropping like flies. Um, it was before the family doctor charter of 1965. Of course, I understood a little of the stress of general practice at that stage. I was two. So one day, uh, one Sunday, everyone in church got some idea, because when the communion bell rang, I shouted out, bloody phone! <laughs> um, so, why am I talking about general practice? I mean, both my parents are dead now, so I think there's an emotional attachment, the idea of trying to uh, maintain something they believed in. But more immediately, as a patient, I am definitely concerned with chronic underfunding and the pressures on general practice. Um, and I'm distressed in principle by a government that seems incapable of understanding the doctor-patient relationship, uh, who sees policy as spin, and are hell-bent on micromanaging through metrics rather than letting GPs do what they do best. Um, my other non-qualification, as Katie said, is that my godmother, Betty, was married to John Eskel, uh, John Sassel, in uh, John Burge's Fortunate Man. And by the way, has anyone read a book called A Fortunate Woman, which came out last year? It's Polly Morland's 
uh, brilliant portrait of the same practice 50 years on, and it's a subtle and very strong argument for continuity of care. It also, by the way, reinstates, I mean, it's an all-female practice now, but it reinstates Betty's role in John Estill's practice. I, think, I don't think she got mentioned in John Berger's book. She was absolutely crucial to the running of the practice, and indeed, as you probably know, to keeping John alive. Um, so that was my father's first practice as a trainee. He, he studied under John Estill, and he learnt a lot. He learnt about the doctor's place in the community. Uh, he learnt about weird and arcane medical practices like taking a swab before you prescribe antibiotics. Uh, in fact, it's down to John Eskill that my father travelled everywhere with a saw in the back of the car in the desperate hope that he'd come across somebody trapped under a tree. Um, of course, things have changed. I realise that things have changed a lot. And that we now know that what you're meant to do with antibiotics is develop bacterial resistance as fast as possible so that lots of us die and then there are enough doctors to go around. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about all this as I struggled with the symptoms caused by Katie's unnecessarily violent phone manner. <laughs> and I made my way in some pain to my local general practice. But when I got there, written in splotchy paint on the door were the words, sorry, closed, and underneath an arrow saying, doctor down there. And I looked down the road and saw one of those red and white tents that you used to see when people used to mend the road. And I went over to the tent and I opened the flap and there was a haunted looking woman sitting on a box with a phone to her ear. Dr. Dunmore, I said, scarcely recognising the ravaged husk of my once named doctor. Yes, she said, but this isn't a contact. You're not contacting me, even though it may look like it. This is not a contact, even less a first contact. I've got all these contacts on the phone. I've got 406 of them waiting, and I've got to get through them all. Could you sign this, please? And she signed me an old PPE blue rubber glove, which had, I did not contact you, written on it, <laughs> for me to sign. She said, if I don't do all of this, my contract's toast. We are trying. We're really trying. At which point, there was another voice. Concentrate on the patient. Don't talk about yourself. And I realised there was a partition in the tent, and a hand drew it back, and there was a man hunched over an iPad, punching furiously into it. I said, hello, who are you? He said, I am the Federated Data Platform. I'm here to automatically assess this doctor's practice of medicine for delivery against government goals. I said, oh, I, I thought you were meant to be a sort of system, a, com a computer system. Very funny, he said. Are you implying that we've fallen behind schedule? Are you implying that the new NHS IT system, which shows every interaction between doctor and patient on a dashboard in Whitehall, was conceived by control freaks who were also idiots who had no idea how to build it? <laughs> Why don't you try the new health centre down the road? He said they've got a really good website. Uh, he, showed me, he showed me on the website there was uh, actually a sort of promotional video and all the doctors were sort of swaggering down the corridors and smiling with uh, jackets slung over their shoulders looking very much like they worked for Accenture. And I said, okay, I'll go and give that a go. And I went in and the first person I saw was one of the doctors from the promotional video and I said, oh, hello, I've, I've just seen you walking down a corridor. Can I help? He said, well, yes, if it happens, yes, I've got some very alarming symptoms, I said. Well, you won't be seeing me then, he said. I'm a doctor. <laughs> and he pointed to some shattered-looking youngsters huddling in a corner just beyond a statue of Julian Tudor Hart being stretched on a rack until he recanted the inverse <laughs> And at that point, my chest exploded, and I fell to my knees. Do you want to see our nutritionist, said the doctor. <laughs> um, Thanks, I said. My old practice didn't have one of those, but it, it did open during COVID. And a thought occurred to me, and I said to him, did, did you open during COVID? Of course not, he said. But we did set up a special vaccination centre, and that delivered huge and undeniable benefits <laughs> to all of our shareholders. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I said, so how come my old partnership practice up the road did stay open throughout COVID? They did face-to-face -face appointments when necessary. They delivered vaccines. How come my parents' GP, also a GMS contract, would do house visits and drop in to see them as they grew frail? and would even come in on their way home to pick up a sample and take it to the local lab. How come, despite what the health department and their poisonous scribes in Fleet Street would have you believe, GP's appointments are up 20% on pre-pandemic levels and with fewer staff? 
How come all of this happens with only 8% of the health budget going on primary care? And isn't it obvious that if you spend more on general practice, you could train more doctors, you could increase staff retention, you could give more patients better treatment and actually save money down the line? And by the way, how come Jeremy Hunt put his name to a half-decent HCHSCC report last autumn, which said that the government should spend more money on general practice, recruitment and retention, they should strengthen the partnership model, and they should give more money to practices in deprived areas. How come he's actually said all that, and now he's in charge of the purse strings, he says you can't have any of it? <laughs> So I took a moment, he looked at me and he said, right, well, all that may be valid, but none of it matters, because soon you'll be dead, and then we won't have to hear any more of your antiquated old rubbish. <laughs> the end. <laughs> now, it's not the end, because I couldn't end like that, that's too damn beat. Um, I thought, that is the kind of end, but then if I just keep talking, maybe something else will happen. So imagine the doctor just said that to me, and then he pointed to a mural behind him, which showed a picture of his face, big face, and on his outstretched hand, uh, a tiny little Wes Streeting. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you could see it was him with his startled bird face, and you could see the little um, USB port on the side of his neck where people jam in flash drives to make him say stuff. <laughs> All GPs on salary, love the private sector, self-referral tonsillectomy, uh, buy app, and uh, DIY small bowel resection. <laughs> and others. And I, I saw that the little West Streeting in the man's hand was saluting proudly as he stood to attention next to the doctor's signet ring, which had the letters NHS in the colours of the stars and stripes. <laughs> right, so that's no better, is it? So, okay. <laughs> a bit one more go. So, how about this? I lay gasping on the floor, and suddenly my family doctor appeared in the doorway. She said, I couldn't leave you in this place. I've sorted out my, <clears throat> excuse me, 406 corners, God knows how. She shoved aside the doctor in the suit. She checked me over. She said, you're not having a heart attack, but we'll get you checked over by a cardiologist just to see what's going on. I had an ECG. They found nothing to worry about. And next time I saw the doctor, she knew all about me because she remembered who I was. And I said to her, how come you're even here? I thought they shut you down. She said, it's 2025 now. And they shut down the APMS place down the road because it wasn't returning 25% to its shareholders. And someone jammed the HCHSCC report into West Streeting's neck. And I got my old practice back with more doctors and better funding. <laughs> that better? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's maybe a bit um, Pollyanna-ish, but I don't think so. There's, a, I, you know, I've got no evidence for this, so I can just say it. But um, <laughs> isn't there a feeling that the penny's dropping a bit? Patients do appreciate general practice, and I speak for all of them. And, and I can do that because the recent report which showed high levels of dissatisfaction with the NHS also showed that those patients, patients who'd actually seen their doctors were extremely satisfied with what they got. Um, you could put it another way, you could say 107 patients said they would rather see their GP than Therese Coffey. But I think patients do trust their, their doctors. Um, I was at the RMS on Monday where Matthew Taylor gave a speech and he maybe it surprised me a bit, but he was advocating decentralization, and he quoted research that showed that in healthcare, bottom-up works better than top-down. So that's an argument against NHS England control, which seems like a good idea. There's, I'm sure you know, there's um, research from Norway which, which shows that continuity of care increases life expectancy, I think, by up to 25%. There's Polly's book, which I mentioned earlier, which is a Sunday Times bestseller. It's spreading the word and describing the heart of general practice and the aspirations of general practice across Britain. Um, our local doctor is under 40. He believes in all of that stuff. It's not just quaint and old-fashioned. And I've spoken to GPs in Cumbria, York, Bristol, Durham. I spoke to one in Hackney yesterday who, I mean, I haven't checked this out, but it sounded like he was doing an incredible job. He wasn't boasting, but basically, patients have a named doctor. They practice continuity of care. They do home visits. It's a partnership practice with five partners. 10,000 patients, and I was really surprised to hear they do nearly all appointments face to face. They have very few phone consultations because he said you just learn so much more on face to face appointments. And they have no eight o'clock rush. They have four receptionists. I'm, I'm going to visit the place because I was so 
interested to discover how he was making this work seemingly against the grain. He didn't sound stressed and he didn't sound mad. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll report back to, to, to Katie, but I was encouraged um, by that. And it seems to me that there's 18 months to shape, to shape health policy for the next 10 years. And that is time to create something like a new family doctor charter based around the idea of growing partnership practices, of improving continuity of care, of increasing payments in poor areas, all that can be put on a USB stick and jammed into Wes Streeson's name. <laughs>